Hello and welcome to Mentorship Masterminds, the PMI podcast where we deep dive into the world of leadership, innovation and growth. I'm your host Mahesh Deshpande and I'm excited to bring another episode of Mentorship Masterminds. Our topic for today's session is agile transformation and to talk to us about this topic we have with us Larry Apke. Larry is an agile coach and agile guru who has trained thousands and thousands of program managers on concepts related to agile management. He is known for his famous courses such as Agile MBA, VUCA MBA that have transformed the lives of numerous program managers. Larry, welcome to Mentorship Masterminds. Thank you, Mahesh. It's great to be here. So today we want to talk about Agile transformation. And before we deep dive into the topic, we would like to know more about you, how your journey, and how did you get into Agile, Agile transformation? Sure. I, uh, I was a software development manager. Uh, at one point in time, and uh, the VP yeah, came in. We had a new VP, and he said, we're going to do Agile. And uh, it was the first time I really heard the term. And this is probably about 14, 15 years ago. And so uh, I remember going to my very first uh, Scrum Master class um, way back then, and I got certified. And um, it was really interesting to me that very first time because I had always worked with small companies prior to this. So we were always doing things that I would kind of classify as agile. And I kind of had to learn this waterfall thing after the, after the fact. And so it was just really interesting to me because I remember my first reaction to the Scrum Master class I took, which was interesting, was kind of, so what? Mm. I didn't understand what the big deal was. It just made sense to me. And uh, it took me a little bit of time to realize this is what wasn't how others did things. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I figured that out, I said, wow, this is pretty fascinating. And I kind of went down this rabbit hole of, of learning as much as I could about not only agility, but, but psychology and sociology and software development and, and how people think and how people behave and how organizations behave. And it was just, I'm still down that rabbit hole and it's, you know, 14, 15 years on. So that's kind of my journey. I think uh, one thing you have common with millennials says you have started first with Agile and then learned about Waterfall because people generally learn about Waterfall and then think about what this Agile is, right, and how to adopt to the Agile mindset. Absolutely. And, and the, the interesting thing is you say mindset because there's, there's always this big debate kind of in the world of Agile, whether it's a mindset or, or you know, we talk about frameworks, frameworks or a whole bunch of other things. Is it a process? And for me, it's always really been about the mindset. It's about how we see the world, actually. Because the, the, the folks who are, who are agilists see the world fundamentally differently mm -hmm. than the folks who might come from a more waterfall background. And it, it, when I teach my classes and when I talk with people, when I coach organizations, it's really about we're all smart people. It's not that you don't get it or can't get it. It's just you haven't seen it. So my job is to really kind of show people a different world and kind of open their eyes to, to different possi possible ways of looking at the world. And, and I, you know, I refer to those as mental models or lenses. And, and that's kind of what my, my kind of training has been about through the years. And that's kind of what my mission is, is just to kind of help people see the world differently. And, and I'm hoping by doing so that uh, they're going to have more tools in the toolbox, so to speak. And, and they're going to have more success in life, whatever they determine you know, however they define success. Makes sense, makes sense, Larry. You talk about mindset, right? This manifesto, Agile Manifesto, was written in uh, early 2000s, if I'm not wrong, right? Mm -hmm. What's your take on the relevancy? I know Agile is still being practiced across organizations and now with scaled Agile and other methodologies that are in place. How do you see the evolution of Agile? And do you see these, the 12 principles that were in the manifesto, are they still relevant today? Well, I mean... For me, it is. To me, that's the whole basis. Because again, what to me, it's a philosophy. It's a way of looking at the world. And so, interestingly enough, my very first book, which I wrote going, it'll be 10 years uh, in June, I think, is when it was first published. It's about the Agile Manifesto. And, and the reason that I wrote it, I, it, it wasn't a book, uh, and I wasn't setting out to, read a, uh, to write a book, but I, I sat down and I wrote a, a blog post on each of the four values and each of the 12 principles. And the reason I did it was I was working at an organization that hosted their version of the Agile Manifesto. Okay. And they changed some of the values and the principles. 
to suit them. <laughs> to suit them, right? And, and to me, I, I shouldn't have been, but I was, I was much younger then. I was a little bit offended. And I thought, I want to make a stand. I want to say, here's what I believe in. I think these things are relevant today. I think they're relative, uh, you know, when it was written, I think it was relative uh, still to this day. And so I wrote that. And, and, and my, uh, my oldest boy, his girlfriend, was actually in PR, and, and I hired her, and she said, hey, you've got a book. I said, good. Put it together, publish it, and that was about 10 years ago, and that was the first book that was on the Ad Domino Festival. That's awesome. Yeah. Do you have any favorite principles among the 12, if you have to pick your top three? I think if I had to pick the, the one that I always say, I even say this in class, which is the 12th one, which is, is that, that we inspect, it's basically about inspecting and adapting. I can't remember, I should remember the exact wording, but... It's, it's really, we sit down and we look at what we've done and then we improve it on a regular basis. And it's feedback it's and about, retrospective. It's about retrospective. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the real key is, is you know, waterfall is, is valid for certain types of work and we get into that. But the one thing about waterfall is they always had that, but they called it a post mortem, which literally means after death. I wasn't very good in Latin, but I got that far. And it didn't really necessarily help us much to have something that came at the end of a very long process. So the process of inspecting and adapting on a regular basis that's built into a framework like Scrum is really, really powerful. And so I think that's probably one of my favorite ones. The, the one that I've, I'm starting to warm up to that I didn't understand as much years and years ago, which is, which is uh, simplicity. There's one that talks about simplicity, the art of not doing things uh -huh. um, and, and keeping things as simple as possible. Again, I can't remember the exact wording unless it's in front of me. But to me, what I've seen in the last few years when I've been doing my coaching and working with large organizations is, is they don't get that one a lot. They, 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 they complexify things, as that's a word. They complicate things where it doesn't need to be. And, and simplicity is a, a really, really powerful do you have an example like how, when you I mean when you say simplicity against complexity making projects complex any example that you'd like to say i'm trying to think if there's anything that comes off the top of my head and there's you know I, I i'm sure that there's some things i just don't have anything right now it's, it's just we have a tendency to silo and those silos become little fiefdoms we all know that and and they take on a life of their own Yep. And that's where a lot of the complexity comes in, is, is we're moving work from place to place within an organization. But if we were to take those silos, I mean, imagine you had seven silos in, in software. I've mostly software development is where I work. And you grab one person from each of those silos and you put them on a single team instead of seven specialized teams. Your ability to move work through the system, right, in, 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 in reducing cost of delay, which is a huge factor, and, and being able to deliver value sooner to your customer, it's, it's at least seven times, right? I mean, because you, you have to take that piece of work and it has to move sequentially through an organization. So that, to me, is a lot of the complexifying things that we do. And I think people do that as essentially in organizations where they feel threatened as well. We tend to make our jobs a little bit more complex and complicated because we don't want to be replaced. Yep. And so... There's just so much. I mean, that's one of the things that, that I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about, but one of the big things about what I consider agility when I talk about psychology and sociology is how are people motivated? How are people led? And it has to do with incentives. And there's just so many, especially large organizations, and, and at this time, you know, we're looking at a lot of folks who are getting laid off in the world of IT. They just don't figure out the incentives. When people are afraid, they're going to act in certain ways. So if I'm afraid I'm going to get laid off and I don't feel psychological safety, I'm going to create some things that are counterproductive mm. to the organization. It's interesting because in my practice, the places a lot of agile coaches go is they'll go directly to the teams and they'll coach the teams. And there's nothing wrong with coaching the teams. But the problem is that if you have 100 teams, but those 100 teams are in a bad system, you're only going to get so far no matter how many coaches you deploy, because you're at the wrong level. Mm -hmm. And the two places that, that when we talk about incentives, that, that coaches should spend more time at, and, and, and I spend more time at now, because I've learned the hard way, is, is finance and HR. Mm -hmm. Because this is where the incentives of the system are built. And you have to look at the incentives. Because if you, 
don't align the incentives, it's like taking seeds and throwing them out on the concrete. What you won't you be able to change the mindset if the incentives are not aligned to the values that you're trying to bring. Absolutely. Upton Sinclair said uh, it's hard to get a man to understand something when his salary means that he should, he doesn't, or he couldn't understand or something like that. I can't remember. But yes, I mean, people are incentivized for certain things, and we have to look at those incentives. If we want agile behavior, if we want agility, we have to make sure that those things are incentivized. A lot of times, those silos, because of the way we budget, is incentivized. So we're incentivizing the very silos that are causing us not to be able to deliver things. So a lot of what I do is to try to find those, what I refer to as perverse incentives, and try to get them uh, to be a little bit more virtuous incentives. Makes sense, Larry. You spoke about behavior and psychology. I'm going to come back to that. But piggybacking on your last point about teams, right? What makes a good agile team? From a size, role, perspective, what's your take on a good agile team that functions? I wrote a, I wrote a blog post about that some time ago, and I just I, I started looking back at my blogs. I'm getting a little nostalgic, and I wrote this probably at least 10 years ago, if not more, and I said there were five things, and let's see if I can remember, it was small, okay. co-located, dedicated, cross-functional, and there's one more I can't remember, but but it, it, so size wise, yeah. we as human beings, if you even if you look at things like short term memory, seven plus or minus two, is our short term memory. That's also what we usually recommend for agile teams. Seven or plus or minus two. Seven plus or minus two. Okay. I always tell people if you get into double digits, a good rule of thumb is you split the team into two. You figure out where you want to split it. It's because it, it has to do with communication, software development, and, and, and anything in the knowledge based world in this in this complex world. Um, needs communication. And the problem is that the communication channels grow geometrically. It's, the equation is n times n minus 1 divided by 2. So if I have seven people on a team, I have 21 lines of communication between them, if I did the math right. I, I, I have to, took my shoes off so I could count. But, but the, the more and more you add, the problem that you run into is that the overhead that's necessary for the communication of the members of the team becomes a, a, a closed team. Yep. So small is a good thing. So again, if you go above, if you get into double digits, you might want to start looking at where you're going to split it into two other teams. The second thing, co-located, is again about the communication. Now, a lot of folks want to do, you know, there's, there's all this stuff about return to work or work from home and all that stuff because of the pandemic. The key is it's really hard for me to work with somebody who's sleeping while I'm awake and vice versa. So Zoom is okay. Face-to-face -face is better. There's a reason why we're face-to-face -face today. Face-to-face -to -face is better for communication because there's so much communication that happens outside of just the words themselves. Yep, I agree. Um, and so Zoom is okay. But if you're on completely different time zones, you're going to have slower communication. And it's not going to be as rich and so you're going to have problems. So co-located is, is one. Dedicated is the, is the thing that when we do project management, we have a tendency to take a person and put them on five different projects instead of dedicating that person to a single backlog. And in fact, if we're doing, and I don't know if we'll get to this today, but if we're doing software products, we probably shouldn't be doing project management. We should be doing product management, and they're not the same thing. And so having the ability to take and create a product backlog and dedicate a team and have all those individuals on the team be dedicated to that single backlog is going to allow me to deliver value sooner, which is really the important part. Stable was the other one I'm talking about. There's a certain stability when it, for communication. So a, anybody, you know, everybody can think about relationships you have, your spouse, your girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever you have, how long you've been together, the way you communicate changes over time. The more stable, the more time you spend together, the easier it is for you to communicate. And because it's about communication, feedback, running, mm -hmm. you have to have stability. And then that last one is really interesting because if I have a small team, I need to make sure that every member of that team can move my product. And again, I'm talking about products, a software product in particular, from beginning to end, from cradle to grave. I want to have all the skills necessary, which means that I need to have different people, right? I don't have a separate QA team or a separate database team and a separate coding team. I have them, uh, those skills represented in this team. But the problem is I have an upper limit 
yep. that I want. So the people on the team have to be able to do multiple things. So you're much better. I would say you're much better with a, with a utility infielder than a designated hitter. If anybody knows yeah. the, the baseball reference, because you need that. Because it's not about the effic the efficiency of the members of the team. It's about the effectiveness of the overall team. It's not about the work that individuals do. It's about the work that the team moves through the system. I could keep people busy. Doesn't mean I'm moving work through the system. Mm -hmm. In fact, I've gone to many organizations that I've tried to help where they're highly efficient and they don't deliver anything. <laughs> I mean, they deliver so little. And it's not because it's because they're, it's busy work. It, it, so efficiency and effectiveness are sometimes opposites. And that's again gets back to this concept of mindset. We have to understand what do we want from our system? We want effectiveness. We don't want efficiency. Efficiency is great if I'm digging ditches, but not if I'm building software. This is so insightful. You touched upon so many points. I can go in three or four directions. But let me come back to uh, the first point that you made on teams, right? Co location. I mean, that's the challenge in today's world, right? Yep. We want companies, want people, teams. Uh, half of them in India, Russia, or Poland, and some in Costa Rica, right? Different roles. Expectation is we are doing agile management, so we want people to work around the clock and get things done faster. Yeah. But in reality, that might not be the way they wish for. So, right. how do you like? How do you approach this? Right? Co-location is ideal yeah, for absolutely. a team, but in reality, today, even if they are co-located, they are not in office. People are working from home remotely. They are not coming to office on the same day of the week. Right. So how do you, how do they tackle this? Well, I mean, so here's the interesting thing. Everything is a compromise, okay. right? Everything we have to look at, every, all the, the factors, and we have to ask ourselves a question, what do we want from our system? And it may be that for whatever reason, people working from home keeps them happier. And we have to factor that into the equation. Because maybe it's really difficult to, to for whatever reason, to, to uh, recruit and retain talent. So we have to look at it, and we have to ask ourselves a question. What does this do to the system that we're creating? I can tell you with, with, without any hesitation that when folks go to Zoom, you're going to lose some of the feedback and communication. Things will be slower, and you have the propensity to probably have potentially quality issues because quality issues tend to, to, to come up because of bad communi poor communication. And if I have half of a team in India and half of the team in the United States, I've got to look at that too. Mm -hmm. And I have to ask myself, what do I want from the system? We're doing this ostensibly either because we can't get talent maybe in the United States or the talent in, and or the talent in India is, is less expensive. Great. What is the cost to that though? What is the trade-off? Because it's always a trade-off. And you have to really understand the, the overall system to a certain degree to be able to make that trade-off because a lot of folks don't think so, right? But again, I think a lot of it comes back to the incentives because if somebody is incentivized to save money on talent and somebody from India, rightfully so, comes in and says, I can save you half of what you're spending, the person who's incentivized to save money is going to say, great, let's yeah. do it. But you have to understand there's going to be knock-on effects. There's going to be trade-offs that you're going to make. Because it's very difficult. We've all, I mean, I, I think everybody in IT, we've done that. We've been yep. there. And we know it's difficult. It's, it's not jingoism or, or, or America first or anything in my mind. If I got to have a, a lot of developers in India, I want to have the whole team in India. Mm -hmm. I, wanna, I want them to be co -located. And if possible, I want to have the scrum master and the product over there. If I can't do that, then I'm going to be making trade-offs. And I have to understand the trade-offs. Right? Got it. It's good to have the entire team located in one location and probably other team is in a different location. Yeah, that absolutely. might be a better approach. Absolutely. If, if, if you came to me and said, I've got 12 people, six of them are in India, six of them are in the United States, I got one team, I'd say, good, split it up into two teams. Mm -hmm. Right? Two teams of six by location. But then you, again, you have to look at the trade off. What am I trading off when I do that? Right? Because maybe I have a certain talent pool with, uh, in, in India that's different from the talent pool in the United States. And yeah. because of that, Splitting them down, uh, you know, co-located wise might not be the best split. That's why there's five things there that I talk about in, in what I consider a, you know, a good agile team, but they're a trade-off, mm -hmm. right? Because you can't have all of them. 
pick your poison. Yeah, <laughs> pick your poison, but understand your poison. Understand. understand yeah. your poison. That's what, that's what really frustrates a lot of folks, is that people making decisions, I truly do believe, are incentivized for one thing, and then the people who have to do the work are incentivized for another thing. And that doesn't always work out well. Yeah. And it's mostly it doesn't work out for the people who are doing the work. You know, when I go into an organization, I tell the people, I said, you're going to, you're going to love me that, you know, the developers, you're going to love me because what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to keep you from working nights and weekends, right? Um, I'm going to try to make your life better because I'm going to get you, try to get you more engaged with the work that you do. And that's powerful and they like it, but it's hard to be engaged when I've got teammates who are halfway around the world who I don't know, who might see on Zoom every once in a while. Yep. Right, we can't build that relationship. And psychological safety, there are five factors in the Google study, which I'm sure a lot of your viewers are, are familiar with, with Project Aristotle. Number one was psychological safety. It's hard to have psychological safety with people you don't know, right? And you can't interact with them as much as you would want to. So that's where all this thing about you know going back to the office or being co-located and spending time with people, it just really does matter because we can't take the humanity out of us and assume that we can do it. And, and this, is, this is one of the things that I find to be the, the kind of assumption that people are making that I want to, to maybe get them to look at differently. You're not ditch diggers. You're knowledge workers, right? And you can't just throw more bodies at the problem and have it solved. Then you can't just throw work all around the world and have it solved. You have to figure out how knowledge workers are fundamentally different and once you know how they're fundamentally different, you're going to make better trade-offs. Until that point, you're going to make probably suboptimal. I won't say right or wrong. Suboptimal trade-offs. Makes sense. Makes sense. Larry. This is so insightful. I, I, each of your answers is leading to multiple questions, and I'm in a dilemma of which one, where, where to go next. Right. So you to, spoke about product versus program management, and there is a difference to yeah, product versus product. product. Product versus project. Do you want to highlight a few insights on that topic? Well, it's because it's of the incentives. So if you look at something, and I'm going to, again, assume software for this example. You have software products. Yep. When you treat them like project, here's what happens. Is you do have people who work on multiple projects, and they go from place to place, and they don't get a chance to really concentrate on certain things, and et cetera, et cetera. But you also have technical debt type of issues and quality issues. Because... Most projects are generally the features that the changes in the features we're going to add to our software. So mm -hmm. we think of it that way. And that's what we're incentivized to do. But we're not incentivized to do the things that are right for the product itself. Okay. And that becomes a problem because what we do is we start to cut corners to deliver the features because that's what's sitting on our project backlog. And that's what we're getting paid to do, right? So there's a lot of problems with project versus product. One of them, they sound this, almost the same, right? I mean, they, and that's an unfortunate you know, thing. But we want to treat our products like products, which is different. And, and the way we go about it is different. The way we fund it is different. The way we build teams around it is different. And we should trade. We do have projects and companies, and we should treat, treat our projects like projects. And so I've, I had this idea years and years ago, and, and I recently bl uh, blogged about it, put up on LinkedIn, PPO, okay, which is Product Pro and Project Management Office. Because I don't have a problem. Uh, I, I mean, you have to have somebody who's keeping an eye on things, so to speak. So I'm okay with the, the concept of having kind of this centralized office as long as it's not getting in the way to help things move through the system. But one of the first things we should determine is, is this a product that we're building or is this a project that we're doing because they're different things the the analogy i use came from uh, general uh, uh, was it creech william creech he was in charge of naval aviation and the maintenance okay and he's on the the deck of the aircraft carrier one day and they had a terrible maintenance record when he took over and he asked one of the the people on board he says why are we so bad at maintaining this air these aircraft and the guy said to him, nobody washes a rental car. And he Creech is scratching his head, kind of like everybody out there is you know, scratching. What do you mean? Nobody washes a rental car. What he's saying is, we don't own the plane. 
I just, I don't know what people do on the planet. I just change the oil. That's my job, right? So that's kind of a project mentality. I'm just doing this piece. I'm not looking at the overall product. So what Creech did, which was very ingenious, is he assigned people to the product, the plane in this case, right? A great analogy. And they would actually paint their names on the side of them so that they had ownership of that plane, that product being a solid product. Guess what happened to the quality? It improved. went through the roof. We can't treat our products like rental cars because what we're going to do is we're going to accumulate a lot of technical debt. And technical debt is like high blood pressure. It's a silent killer. It's going to mean that any changes that you make to your product in the future are going to take much longer because it's like walking in quicksand. The code is, is unintelligible because people put fixes in and did this and this. And there's not enough testing here because we didn't have time for testing and this and that and the other. And it's a slow erosion of the quality of the product when I'm treating it like a project. So interestingly enough, one of my most recent gigs, uh, I was working for a, a pretty large company doing an agile transformation. And we looked at incentives. And one of the incentives we looked at was how do we fund things for this IT, you know, for our software development. And it was all project and scope. So what we did, and I think it's the largest, fastest transformation of its kind, is we changed from project Correct. and scope funding, over a billion dollars, by the way, to product and capacity funding. And it's completely different because what we said is, here's our products now. How much do we wish to invest in this product this year? How much do we wish to invest in this product this year? And so I used to tell the business, because I said, why are we doing this? I said, look, every idea you have is funded because the product is funded. The best ideas are being built. So now you prioritize the projects based on the product so that the product is, you deliver a product at the end of the day and not just focus on the, delivering one project. Right. The product becomes primary. And when the product becomes primary, every project is just scope that would change something about that product that is working towards the delivery of that product absolutely but what you get is you is one is you start paying down technical debt and the second is you learn how to deliver the product faster so the things that we tend to call devops yeah now is something that i fought through my product funding because it's it's kind of you might want to take the analogy of like amazon or a warehouse you got all these wonderful goods and you sold them right but you got one truck who can deliver it. Now, if you're doing project management, you don't care because what you want to do is you're just going to sell the product. But if you're doing product management, you're going to say, how do I get the goods to my customer? So you're going to spend money on more trucks. You're going to spend more money on, on, on highways and, and, and widening the road and fixing the bridges and, and everything, the infrastructure, to deliver the product to market, which we don't do in a project management world. We just don't. And, and so that was a huge thing. In, in, in about seven months, we took a billion dollars worth of spend. We changed from project and scope to product and capacity. It's probably one of the highlights of my career. Fascinating. I want to switch gears sure. and talk about the different methodologies, right? But prior to that, I want to talk about BTD, sure. behavior-driven development, mm -hmm. and also a test-driven development, which is associated with that. Yeah. Can you, uh, for the benefit of our audience, explain like what is BDD and what are the benefits of thinking about program management in terms, agile management in terms of BDD? Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's one of my passions. So this is something that, that I came across, it's probably now about 10, 12 years ago. There was a, there was a, it was during a retrospective, there was a gentleman, his name is Jim Barrows. He helped me out a lot of ways. So kudos to Jim if you ever hear this. But he, he said uh, during one of the retrospects that we should do BDD. Now, I was the scrum master, and I was also the software development manager. And I said, sure. I had no idea what it was. I said, sure, let's do it. And so we did it. And I didn't really understand it, but, but the developers liked it. And it seemed to do a good job. For whatever reason, I didn't get that deep into it at the time. And then I went to another company. And we were having a heck of a time getting uh, user stories and acceptance criteria requirements, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, so that we can get it to the developers and get it working and create good software. So I said, we should try this BDD thing because mm -hmm. it seemed to work in this other place. But here's the problem, guys. I didn't know anything about it, really. So I had to do the research. So I did the research, and I went down that rabbit hole. What I found was this. 
BDD, behavior driven development, a lot, is really for about communication. Because as we started this, we talked about feedback and communication, how critical it is in, in software development in the complex world. It's about communication. It's about the ability to understand through acceptance criteria the behavior that you want and desire from the system. And it came about, I talk a lot about this, I teach it in my class, and, and I've given a lot of talks on it. It came about because Dan North and some others were saying, we want developers to do test-driven development, which is, for those of you who don't know, this is crazy. Because what you're saying is, I'm not going to write a single line of production code unless I write a test first. Now, there's a lot of folks out there running around. They say, we're doing test-driven development. I say, when do you write your test? Well, we write our tests as soon as we write the code. Now, that's not test-driven development. That's automated testing. Good thing, not the same thing. So you write your tests first, and you don't have anything to, fix, you know, to do the test, so it fails. And then you write the code that makes the test pass. And this is fantastic. It's, an, it's, it's how you build quality into your products, your software products. But what he found, Dan North, developers weren't doing it. So he tried to figure out all, I'm sure he tried to figure out all kinds of things, but he finally came up with this thing. Let's find out what we can agree on with the business so that we can write these tests, these, you know, do this test-driven development. So he came up with BDD. And the beauty of it was it was meant to help people do TDD, which it does. Um, these are actually acceptance tests because you're writing your acceptance criteria first in human readable English, right? The, the, we usually call it Gherkin syntax. It's, it's given when and then, which is really a test case. Given these prerequisites, when I do this, then I expect the beha this behavior from the system. Done it with all my teams. I wouldn't do it. You know, if I took a team on today, I wouldn't do it without teaching. I wouldn't force them to do it. I'd teach it to them. Because when I brought it to this other place and I finally knew what it was, we were having so much trouble with getting the, the acceptance criteria and the requirements. As soon as we started doing this BDD, it's like the, the clouds parted and the sun <laughs> shone. You know, it's like Moses parting the, the river or whatever, uh, the sea. And just things just move so much quickly. And I thought, wow, I'm on to something here. So I did, you know, I kept doing more research and more research. And, and then I started teaching it and, and everything. It is, in my mind, when you talk about software development, there are no silver bullets. Garbage in, garbage out. We, should, we all know that. But if you do BDD well, it is the silver bullet in software development. It is, it is the thing that's going to ensure that you have a quality product. Why? Because you're going to write the acceptance tests first. And if your code allows those acceptance tests to pass, you've done what you should have done. Does it also, the advantage of that is it help connect your business program product manager with engineers speak the same language? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's the big part. Because that's why you write your acceptance criteria. Right? Yeah. Well, because here's the thing. If you think about it, when, when I first did this, I, I, I was down in San Antonio. I was doing a gig down there. As we were talking about it before the podcast. It was my first real you know, coaching gig where I had a, a coach title. And I'm down there, and I start teaching BDD to this team. We were in the innovation labs, and, and this team was one of the best teams I ever worked with. And, and they started doing it. And we were getting these huge, great results from doing it. And it, it was because of the communication, Right. The reason I bring up that story is because when I would talk to the business people down there, they would say that the developers spoke dolphin speak. Okay. <laughs> right? And I said, what do you mean dolphin speak? He said, well, I know it's a language, but I can't understand anything they're saying. Right? And this is common, by the way. It's very common for the business to request something from development, the developers to hear something and, and execute it. Right? And then deliver it back to the business. And then the business says, this isn't what I wanted. Uh, I mean, this is one of the reasons why we have it, it, one of the, the agile principles is business and development must work together every, uh, daily. Yeah. Right? Because you need that feedback to make sure that you're doing the right thing. Well, when you look at that principle and you say business and developers must work together daily, what does that mean? For me, that's BDD. For me, that's going through and saying, what is the, the business telling the developers, what is the behavior I expect from the system? And the people who are instrumental to that are the people who I say have the QA mindset. Because Liz Keough, you worked with Dan North when they were putting this BDD stuff together, and I met her one time, and she, she, she's a fascinating uh, human being. She said to me, the QA people are the what about people. 
Because they say, what about this and what about that? And they come up with all these scenarios, and that's what we call them, BDD scenarios. They come up with all these scenarios. Which probably the business which might also not have thought of. The business wouldn't have thought of. And we have to make sure that our software addresses them. Now, we don't have to address every scenario that might come up through somebody's head, but we have to address some of them. And the business gets to decide. And so when you're writing the acceptance criteria, you write your stories. It's usually you write the stories as a, I want, so that. I'm sure that the audience is familiar with that. Great. You start writing acceptance criteria, you might, you might have one phrase, which I call the, the story narrative, as a, I want, so that. But you can have maybe 10 different things in acceptance criteria. 10 different scenarios. 10 different scenarios. And the cool thing about doing that is it also helps us in so many other ways. Not only that, it helps us. In fact, I wrote a blog about it. So I, it, it was written like 10 years ago. It's called Why BDD Changes Everything. 10 Reasons Why BDD Changes Everything. And, but one of the things is now if I need to split the work if it's too big, if I have 20 different scenarios, I can find five scenarios that are more like them. I could split that work off. Now I've got... Two different pieces of work. It, it differs a total dimension, a different perspective, right? To a BDD. Oh, oh yes, it, it's it's like I said, it's the best thing that you can probably do when it comes to if you're doing Scrum. There is a time that we spend in refinement, and there's two different types of refinement. I talk a lot about backlog refinement, which to me is value, effort, and sequence, getting the work sequence. But once you get into detail about the work, which I'm going to refer to as story refinement, because we generally call those things stories. BDD is what you use to refine. And that's where most teams, a lot of teams, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of teams get it wrong. They don't spend enough time in refinement and they don't focus their refinement on things like, you know, using BDD for acceptance criteria, which, which just allows you to be so much more successful in delivery of quality software. This is so insightful. Thank you for sharing. I want to also talk about, you said about refinement and the delays in refinement, right? There is a cost associated with these delays. When, it, when, speak, when yep. we have delays in projects yep. and we have backlogs across all teams, can you talk a bit more, more about the cost of delays in agile program management? Yeah, so this is one of the reasons, again, we, go to, we, we, we talk about product versus program because what we want to do is we, we want to create a product backlog and not necessarily a program backlog. Although you could have both, but, but again, the, the, the primary thing for me is what do I do for my products if I have product? And, and so what we want to measure is we want to measure how long does it take to deliver? What is the cycle time to deliver something? And how does that affect our ability to make money or avoid litigation or, or whatever the case may be? And that's cost of delay. What is the what is the uh, the effect of time against some kind of predicted outcome as far as a monetary outcome? And there's a cost to it, right? Because let's say I have a, a feature that I could deliver, and that feature I know is going to make me a million dollars a year for the next five years. If I deliver it today, great. If it takes me six months, I could start to calculate what that cost me by not delivering it today. That's what I generally want to talk to people about. And when I'm doing it, I actually, uh, my, my most recent book is called AppKey's Golden Rule of Agile. It's uh, focus on value delivery. And I talk about sequencing the work to reduce cost of delay because that's really what you're after is you want to reduce cost of delay as much as possible. And there's, there's, a, there's a, uh, an equation that's called CD3, which is cost of delay over duration. Cost of delay over duration. Cost of delay over duration, CD3. And what you ultimately want to do to deliver the most value to your customers in the shortest possible time, which is AppKey's gold rule of Agile, is you want to have the things with the highest cost of delay and the shortest duration to deliver. Now, when I'm working with teams, I don't use the terms cost of delay or duration. I use proxies. I use value and effort. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm working with a team, we're going to take everything on that backlog and we're going to assess relative value. We're going to assess relative effort. And then we're going to look at that ratio, and the higher the value to effort, the sooner we should do it. This is mathematical. This has nothing to do. And then we're going to sequence the work so that, this, so that that sequence will deliver the most value in the shortest amount of time, given our constraints. Because every system has constraints, right? There's dependencies. There's temporal constraints. There's all kinds of reasons why we can't just deliver the most valuable things. So we factor those things in. And so that's the book. Anyway, I was shameless plug for the book, but no, this is good. Is all this is good. We'll have a 
we'll have the title of the book in our chat for YouTube. But I, I'm envisioning this in a two by two matrix and you're talking about duration and uh, efforts, right? So the cost of uh, effort sh should be less and the, it takes less least amount of time and is more critical. In yeah, or I, I, I value, the word value, value, value. I the word valuable and then I, use the word, I usually use effort mm -hmm. to describe time because again, it's mostly software development. And usually when you look at something like software development, it's, it's very labor intensive. So, so the effort that it takes is going to be kind of, it's the same thing when you buy a car. You're gonna look at the value of the car versus what you can afford, right? And you're gonna come up with something and you say, this is the best value I can buy. It's kind of the same kind of thing, right? Yeah. But, but it, it's, it's, in this case, what, what do I wanna deliver? And I'm big on sequence, by the way, because people will come to me and they'll use the words priority or ranked order or something like that. I like the word sequence. I'm one of the few coaches, I don't know why this doesn't catch on, that uses that term, because I think that's really what it's about. It's what is the sequence that we're going to roll out our work? And can we do so in a way that delivers the most value in the shortest amount of time? The answer is you can. You can either get my book or, or listen to my blog post or whatever that, where I describe it, or you can hire me or whatever. Or, you know, it doesn't matter. This is really an important and critical thing because every time I've done these exercises with teams, especially product owners on the value side, a lot of times if you're doing project management, here's how it works. I get a bunch of scope and a huge batch, which is a big problem because bigger the batch, higher cost of what? I get a bunch of stuff in a big batch and then I go to some meeting or a group of people and I say, approve this. I got a, I got, I got a million dollars worth of work. And it might take them a month to approve it, two months to approve it, whatever. And then they finally do it. And then I got to bring people to it and everything else. And all this is, is cost delay which is why, again, you want to move to product funding because in product funding, I can move the work directly onto the product backlog and then I just sequence it. Mm. So it's the most important thing. I could start on it tomorrow because it's already been funded. So all this thing about going out and funding scope just slows us way, way down. And so when we're looking at things like cost of weight, that's why I'm, I'm big on sequence because we want to make sure that we're doing things in sequence and the, the agility to it is I can continue to add to that backlog. All I have to do is reassess value effort right, in sequence, continually, so that any time I can change my course because I'm changing it because I'm delivering more value per unit of time, as opposed to if I have a project, I'm going to do what's funded. Yeah. Right? Yep. Which, which if I have a big batch of stuff, within that batch, there's going to be some things that are really valuable and some things that aren't so valuable, but I had to batch it all together. But what do I do? I do all of it, even the low value stuff. We shouldn't do that. Not in a product world, we shouldn't do it. In a product world, we should say, what are the most valuable things I can do for this product? Regardless of where they come from, right? Which is why you gotta change the funding because the funding determines the incentives and the incentives determines the focus and the focus determines the behavior. Larry, I had so many conversations on this topic with so many people, but nobody has put it so succinctly and it's been so insightful just listening to you. I can go for all are discussing about agile transformation, but I would like to uh, come to last few questions. Sure. Let's talk about psychology. We had a guest on the podcast who has been in many leadership roles. She was the chief product officer at Nextdoor. And she said when she hires product teams, she classifies it into three different teams. One is product managers who understand business, product engineers who understand engineering and technology. And the third one she said was uh, people who understand, who have a background in psychology, anthropology, and so on, who understand human nature, human behavior, mm -hmm. right? And I think it's also critical for program managers. I think you, you talk about cognitive bias and mm -hmm. other biases, right? It's important for program managers to also have some skills, probably not a PhD in anthropology, but have some social skills, right? So what is your take on this and what are some of the skills that program managers Program managers try to focus on managing programs and developing soft skills, or they call power skills these days. But from a sociology perspective, what's your take on this? What are some of the things that program managers should be aware of and should prepare themselves to be successful as a program manager? Well, I, I, I don't think I've heard the term power skills, but I like it. Okay. Because, I mean, the soft skills are, are sometimes the, the tougher ones. I don't know why we call them soft skills. I mean, the, the thing that I found is when you look at, so, uh, things like soft skills or power skills or whatever we want to call them, they're part of the complex world, Yeah. right? And so we, ha as human beings, we have a tendency to have an aversion to it. 
what we like is we like things that are solid. Yeah, <laughs> we don't like soft. Right, we don't like soft, we like solid. What's solid? Mathematics, science, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm a big fan of both mathematics and science. But, but the problem we have there is we're looking for determinism as the word. People are non-deterministic, they're complex, right? And complex systems are non-deterministic. So, so this is one of the reasons why I, you know, I started branding it the VUCA MBA, which for, for people is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, which is the way the world is. And guess what people are? They're VUCA, right? So the ability to understand how people think, and you would, you know, we all think, so we would think, gosh, that's easy. It's not always that way, because when we start putting in, the, again, power of incentives, we start looking at cognitive biases, we weren't built for this. So in, in my class, which I think is, is really different from what you would get in most classes, I do a, a, a whole talk on cognitive bias. And the reason I want to is you have to imagine, I'm reading the book Sapiens right now. It's a great book, by the way. Um, Which one, sorry? Sapiens. Sapiens. It's um, and it talks about the fact that, that we create stories, right? And, and that's what we do as human beings. But we evolved in a very physical world. It talks about human evolution. And humans evolved in a physical world. They evolved in a simple world. And our brain evolved in that world. So the physical world is very safe and comfortable and intuitive for us, whereas the, the world of intellect and knowledge is new, and it's not safe, and it's not predictable. It's not deterministic, right? So we tend to shy away from it because we're not good at it mm. by nature. There's over 700, I think it's 700, or 170, sorry, not 700, 170 different cognitive biases that science has found. Well. Wow. And what these things really are is, is it's that glitch that comes into our operating system because we evolved in this physical world. And now we live in, an, a, a, for lack of a better word, knowledge world, an intellectual. And what we were built for doesn't translate. So a lot of the things we do in the world of agility, when we talk about the biases and things, we're asking, how does this affect us? And why, did, why does it matter? Yeah. Right? And so... For me, you know, anyone who comes to my class is going to get this because I think it's fundamental to start having an understanding of the software glitches that we have as human beings and how this takes us away from being optimal. The biggest example in the project management world is sunk cost fallacy. Sorry? Sunk cost fallacy. Sunk cost. I think most of your viewers are probably familiar with sunk cost. Is is the concept of I've already spent X number of dollars, I'm going to keep spending money. But the rational way to look at it is do I have an expected rate of return at any point in time? And if the answer is no, you should stop doing the work. We don't do that as human beings. Why? Because somehow we evolved mentally to have an aversion to, you know, stopping things. So there was some evolutionary advantage. But we're also very tribal for the most part because we grew up in small bands and tribes. And, and we were related to the people we knew so that we have an affinity for people who look like us. Absolutely right? But that doesn't mean that we all have to be race. What that means is we have to recognize the fact that we have this in our DNA, we have this in our psyche, we're all human. Everyone has it. This is the beauty of it, by the way. But we also recognize the fact that we should treat everybody as equal, regardless of race or regardless of what tribe they come from, so we can override these glitches. glitches. So my job is to, here's your biases, Let's talk about what they are so that you can be wary of them. You're still going to fall for them if you're not careful, but pay attention to them because if you can overcome them, you can be more optimal. You can be more successful. So that's why, to me, I think everyone should have this now. So being um, aware of your biases itself is half battle one. Is that's what you're saying. Absolutely. I mean, if, if you say to yourself, look, we all have these, including myself, I can start to look at, am I doing this, mm. right? Am, 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 am I exhibiting some of this behavior? And what does this do for me in business? Which is, again, you know, things like incentives and, and systems and things like that. It's, it's all about the psychology of the individuals within the system. I mean, if you're going to do a transformation, there may be people who disagree with me on this, but I think the transformation starts here, and it starts with every individual in that organization. Because this is where we can transform. So if we transform enough minds within an organization, then we have a better chance of actually transforming the organization. So when I go into, you know, an effort, one of the first things I want to do is I want to teach my, you know, what I call now the VUCA MBA. 
I want folks to have these new ways of looking at the world, because if we get enough people who have these different ways of looking at the world, the odds of us being successful in a transformation goes way up, because we will do things that are... The, the key is we don't want to do everything in, that's intuitive to us. Mm. The complex world is counterintuitive. Why is it counterintuitive? Because we didn't evolve for it, right? I'll give you an example, counterintuitive, paraprogramming, great practice in software development. Doesn't make sense in the physical world, right? Doesn't make sense. Why do I have two people doing the same thing? That's the first thing I came to me when somebody said paraprogramming is a great thing to do. I was like, what are you talking about? Doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It's counterintuitive, right? Because it's not the individual efficiency, which is great in the physical environment, which we intuit, it's we're moving value through the system fast, mm. which is, again, counterintuitive in some respect. And so seeing the world differently and understanding our biases and all the other things that, that I try to teach in my class, among other things, helps us, again, to be more optimal because we see the world differently and we understand that maybe it doesn't make sense. I mean, uh, I'll give you one last example. Anybody who's driven in the snow, ice, what do you do? Drive into the skid. Mm. Counterintuitive. Your body won't want to do it. You have to learn how to do it. I mean, that's just a simple one. But there's a lot of things in life that you can't just trust your intuition for. And this is one of the problems we ha that, that I have when I work with leadership and organizations is, is I trust my gut. Well, maybe not so much. Maybe it is right. Maybe it's not. It's so powerful. I know you read a lot. Yeah. So uh, do you have any recommendations for book, uh, any book recommendations, one or two books that you suggest our readers read so that they develop their understanding of psychology, cognitive bias, or even agile uh, product or program management? Yeah, so in my class, we had five books, okay. I think, that we used to cover. Um, and these are, the, these are the books, I think, that, the, that your viewers would get the most help out. But from the, from, from the standpoint of kind of People in psychology and sociology, et cetera, the two books that, that, that we t talked about in the class, and there's more, but the two books that we covered were Drive by Dan Pink. Drive. Drive. It talks about how people are motivated. Again, counterintuitive. People aren't motivated necessarily by money mm -hmm. uh, in the knowledge-based world. The second one is Peopleware. Peopleware was written years and years ago. It's um, Tom, uh, Tom DeMarco and Timothy Lister. And this was a book... Uh, again, I'm going back to, to uh, Jim Barrows, uh, who, who um, was one of the developers I worked with, and he was instrumental because he said, Larry, you're a guy, good guy, but you don't know anything about software developers. I thought, that's crazy because I, I was a software developer. I was a good one. That's why I went into management. But he says, you need to read this book. Is and it I, about not treating people as resources? Well, yeah, because you have hardware, software, and then you have pe people, it's the people doing the work. You have to understand that this is one of the things that Agile really got nailed on the head is, is, is again, we're, people aren't resources, they're people, yeah. right? If I'm digging ditches, great. I can treat people like resources. If I'm working with people who are knowledge workers, it's different. It's, different. it's a completely different ballgame. So you need to understand why it's different and how it's different. And because, again, if you understand these things, if you see the world differently, you're going to make better decisions, right? And, and you're going to have a, a, a better chance of being successful. That's the other thing in this VUCA world. There's no guarantee you're going to be successful. That's, yeah. that's the point of the VUCA world is that, that there are no guarantees. It's not deterministic. But if you do certain things, if you see things certain ways, you're going to up the odds. It's kind of like going to the casino and knowing how to count cards. You're probably still going to lose all your money, <laughs> but you're going to lose it a lot slower if you learn how to count cards. This has been an interesting conversation, Larry. Uh, we have a fun rapid-fire round for you. Just five, six questions. Quick, expect quick answers. So here we go. As a program manager or as an agile coach, what do you prefer? Daily stand-ups, do you think essential or hype? Essential. Uh, remote agile teams, more productive or more disruptive? More disruptive. AI in agile, artificial intelligence. We didn't get a chance to cover AI, but do you think it's a game changer or do you think it's more of a hype? Game changer. Do you want to elaborate on AI? Yeah. yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is, I think it's going to take us a while to figure out how it's going to be a game changer, but I know it's a game changer. There is rarely a day that goes by now that I don't use artificial intelligence to help me. And, and, and here's how I'm going to say it to, to the folks. This is what I believe. It is a non-judgmental collaborator. So okay. if I have an idea, I'm going to bounce it off of AI, and I'm going to see what AI has to say. And I'm not going to take what AI says exactly. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, ah. Here's another opinion. Yeah. Here's another way of looking at it. 
I like this. I'm going to borrow this. I'm going to borrow this. And I'm going to keep bouncing ideas off of it. So when I do, I, I do a show every week, a live a LinkedIn live show called Relentless Learning. And I give a talk, a, a, a talk, 10 minute talk every show. Okay. And then I have a guest who does 10 minute talk. When I come up with a topic, the very first thing I'll do is I say, uh, Chad GPT, I'm going to do this topic. What do you think? That's it. Open-ended. I just want to see what comes up because what, what these things, large language models do is it has access to a whole bunch of people's writings and opinions. Yep. And so I want to see what others have said. It's not that I'm going to take what it gives me mm-hmm. and run with it. I'm going to take what it gives me like I'm having a conversation with you and I'm going to say, hey. That's interesting. And that's how I treat it too. I actually treat, this, is, this would be my tip. I treat AI as if it were a person. And I got this from, from Ian, uh, a, a friend of mine, because he works with all the time. Treat it like it's a person. So I'll say, please, are you interested in helping me with this? Thank you. This is really good. I talk to it just like I talk to you on Slack. Mm. And it talks back to me. And it does so in a way that helps me to understand. It's very rare I use anything verbatim. Of course. It, I'm sure it does happen from time to time also. Oh, this is a good quote. I'm going to copy and paste that. But man, it's great for bouncing ideas off of something. Indeed. Right? I don't see it. Re- I don't see it. I do see it actually. And I'm very concerned that it's going to take away people's jobs because it's going to make people more productive. And when people are more productive, a lot of companies can say, hey, great, I've got more productive people. I can spend less, and so now I can make more money because, you know, I need another yacht. But it is going to help individuals. So if you're, if, if you're an individual contributor or you have your own business, like you're a consultant or something, it's going to help you be more productive, right? And so there's, like everything, like I said, we started this out, you know, early about trade-offs. It's a trade-off. There's, there's some miraculous things to do, but it's going to be a game changer. Just, just like when, when I first went on the on the web, yeah, and I saw a browser, cloud. and I said, "This is a game changer, right?" You know, I mean, it's just the way it is. So, we don't know how it's going to change things, but it's going to change. It's things. definitely going to change. It's changed my life already. So, I'm going with game changer. Okay, <laughs> future of agile, bright or disruptive? I don't know. It's disruptive. I'm going to say it's cloudy. Uh, I wouldn't say it's bright. This is supposed to be rapid fire, so I won't go into Okay, okay. <laughs> Agile certifications, worth it or not? That's a tough one. You broke my brain on that one. <laughs> it's, it's both. If you need one to have a job, go get one. Is it going to actually teach you what you want to know? Probably, Probably not. So it's both. Last question. Best way to engage and educate? Lectures, podcasts, or mentoring programs? All of the above. All of the above. I, I'm a big fan of lecture. I've had people say, you, 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 see, you see my classes. And, and for those who are out there, I, you know, they're free up on LinkedIn. And, uh, or not LinkedIn, but uh, YouTube. Go find, right? And it's lecture. You see it. I think it's pretty effective. It is. Podcast. We're having a good time here. People are learning things. Great. Mentorship. Him and the human touch. They're all good. Use them all. Awesome. Larry, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It was an insightful, honest conversation. We, I'm sure our audience learned a lot, got few insights about Agile Transformation. Thank you once again. Thank you for being thank on you. Mentorship. I really appreciate it. Thank you for tuning into today's episode of Mentorship Masterminds. Today's episode with Larry Apke on Agile Transformation. I'm sure you got few nuggets of wisdom on managing Agile projects and would help you on your Agile journey. Keep listening to Mentorship Masterminds. We have amazing episodes on related topics or topics related to leadership, innovation, and project management. Do keep listening to Mentorship Masterminds with me, your podcast host, Mahesh Deshpande. Until next time, keep thriving, keep inspiring. (laughs) 